Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Logan for Liberty podcast. I'm coming at you from the Pacific Northwest, where the sun shines so bright just to rain a few hours later. How are you all doing? I hope you all, you are all having a fantastic day. So, I would just like to praise Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky for upholding the Constitution, and not just the Constitution. What is he specifically upholding? Well, Rand Paul, as you all know, I'm a fan of his father, Rand Paul, but Rand Paul is upholding not only the Constitution, but the specific tenets that were listed in the Constitution, or alluded to in the Constitution, that are directly related to what we should consider the most important elements of our government, or even quasi-libertarian or classical liberal, or even the rhetoric of the Republican Party, and that is limited government, checks and balances, decentralization, and a distribution of power, if there is to be a centralized power. So... I, I don't feel like I need to beat you on the head with a lecture about what the Constitution says, what it means, but I do think it is important to sort of get the fundamental gist down of what's going on here. So before I get into the story, actually, let me read a little bit of the article so it all makes sense. Let me give you the context, and then we can parse what is going on. The Senate, this is from Fox 12 Oregon, by the way. Um, Fox 12 Oregon is uh, one of the news channels in my state. So this is how I found this out, and then of course I saw uh, an article from Fox News, Reason Magazine, The Libertarian Republic... And I read all of them to see if there was any key details that I needed to miss, and some of them had more details than others one others did. So I will start with the Fox 12 article, which is uh, from kptv.com. So, uh, the Senate likely now has enough votes to pass a measure blocking President Donald Trump's national emergency declaration after Senator Rand Paul signaled his support for the resolution of disapproval. I can't vote to give extra constitutional powers to the president, the Kentucky Republican said Saturday, according to the Bowling Green Day News. I can't vote to give the president the power to spend money that hasn't been appropriated by Congress, Paul said at a Warren County Republican Party fundraising dinner. According to the newspaper, we may want more money for border security, but Congress didn't authorize it. If we take away those checks and balances, it is a dangerous thing. The resolution introduced in the House passed in the chamber on Tuesday with 13 Republicans voting with Democrats. And just so we make this clear, one of the congressmen who voted in favor of the resolution to block Donald Trump's national emergency was a person who is considered to be an ideological ally to Rand Paul, and that would be Justin Amash, who is a congressman from a district in Michigan. Um, I'm not quite sure which district, I couldn't tell you. But there's three main people in in Congress that are really considered sort of similar ideologically who represents sort of a more libertarian-leaning group. That would be Senator Rand Paul. That would be Congressman or Representative Justin Amash from Michigan. And then Representative Thomas Massey from Kentucky, also where Rand Paul is from. Uh, They all, they all, all, all three of them give lip service to libertarianism. They mention libertarianism. Thomas Massey is a little more reluctant to embrace the term libertarian, even though he has used it before. Rand Paul is sort of in the middle. He's a little more 
He's a little less reluctant to call him a libertarian, but he doesn't call him a full-on... He, he gives a lot more lip service to libertarianism than Thomas Massey does, or maybe on the same level, it depends. Justin Amash, on the other hand, has entirely embraced libertarian, as opposed to uh, libertarian-leading Republican. So... What Rand Paul said was extremely important, and, and let's parse it. I can't vote to give extra constitutional powers to the president. I can't vote to give the president the power to spend money that hasn't been appropriated by Congress. So what is he doing here? Well, let's read the last sentence. We may want more money for border security, but Congress didn't authorize it. If we take away those checks and balances, it is a dangerous thing. So what is he doing? He's saying that I agree with the idea or the notion that we need border security and that we, that we may even need more money allocated to the border for fencing, some sort of wall, units, uh, uh, border agents protecting the border. He's saying that he agrees with these basic principles. But he's also saying, but you know what is more important than what I believe on the southern border? The Constitution that I was sworn in to protect. The Constitution that every politician, mostly Republicans, give lip service to. The Constitution that uh, the Republican base always brings up when talking about the Second Amendment. What Rand Paul is doing is he is saying, listen, I, I get that we want some more border security. I even agree with the, the proposition to allocate money to border security. But if it didn't come from Congress, then it is unconstitutional. So not only is he upholding the Constitution, he is upholding... As I said earlier, the basic tenets that th this country was supposed to be founded on, the thing that the Constitution alludes to, and that is limited government. Not just limited government, but as I said before, decentralization of power. So, centralized power, a central government, was resisted in our country's history, which is why we had the Articles of Confederation before we had the Constitution of the United States. And then this is why this is partly not the entire reason, but this this is partly why the South, the Confederate States of America, wanted to break off from the Union. That, that's only part of it. Yes, slavery had something to do with it, but that's not the point of the conversation today. Basically, even though the a central government was established. James Madison, who was the proponent at the time for central government, a more powerful government, so the United States could be a more perfect union. He still recognized, and definitely the anti-federalists recognized, all right, fine, if you have a central government, then let's at least keep the idea of decentralization on the table here. You're attempting to centralize the government, but let's decentralize it. They all have this sort of agreement. Now, how far it went from decentralization to centralization, what powers the central government would have, how it would operate, they had some differences. James Madison was no Alexander Hamilton, that's for sure. But at the time, he also wasn't an anti-federalist. So, what did we get? We, we got the three branches of government that each have equal but separate powers. They each have what they are supposed to do. And Congress is the branch of government that is supposed to allocate resources, set the budget, implement taxes. This isn't supposed to be the job of the president. So what Rand Paul is doing is he is upholding these values that Republicans supposedly believe. But yet they... Well, no, they don't even acquiesce. They, they they surrender willingly. They're not reluctant about surrendering to presidential executive power. 
So, that's what I mean by when I say Rand Paul upholds the Constitution. And let's be clear, he... So, let's go to the Libertarian Republic article, which uh, adds a little more context, which is even more important. Uh, in the speech given at the event, mainly praising the actions of President Donald Trump, Senator Paul made an interjection about his thoughts on Trump's national state of emergency, saying it would set a dangerous precedent. He made this statement in front of 200 Republican politician supporters. Um, I can't vote to give the president the power to spend money that hasn't been appropriated by Congress. We already read that. Paul said just moments after drawing applause for his praise of some of Trump's policies and his ridicule of some congressional Democrats. Um... Paul himself lauded Trump for his judicial appointments, particularly Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch. He also called Trump's State of the Union Address a great speech and praised his stand against socialism and his comment that great nations don't fight endless wars. So this context is extremely important, especially when talking about why Rand Paul is opposing Trump on this this particular instance. And the reality is, this important detail is that Rand Paul kind of agrees with Donald Trump about border security. This isn't one of the what Democrats do where they give lip service to the border and border security whenever a Republican is not in office. He is giving lip service to border security and everything else even when Trump is in office. <clears throat> but he's saying... What is more important than what I want is the law of the land, the law that governs us, that I was sworn in to protect. I, I keep repeating myself. There was another point. Oh, yeah. Um. So, partly how I found this was I went to, I, I read my local news, KPTV or Fox 12. Fox 12 is the channel that is on on, on uh, cable. But the website is KPTV, although the logo says Fox 12 to try to mend any confusion out there, try to try to make it make sense. That's what they're doing, nonetheless. So I decided, all right, well, let me see on Facebook, because obviously my local friends who are into politics, especially my conservative friends, are going to read this and they're, they are going to have opinions. And a lot of my conservative-leaning friends love to praise the Constitution, especially the Second Amendment, but they tend to throw everything else at, out when it's beneficial to their belief, meaning they're only, they don't care about the Constitution or the law of the land, which I would typically say, all right, fine, whatever, just be honest about that. But they argue in favor of the Constitution, so I decided to see what my friends were posting, and I decided to read the comments under the KP12 article on Facebook, and it was brutal. Republicans and conservatives were calling Rand Paul a traitor to America and a traitor to Republicans. And stuff like that. And then, of course, trying to justify uh, Donald Trump's national emergency. But th th they miss one focal point is, all right, fine. Rand Paul is a traitor to Republicans. He's obviously not a traitor to Americans because he believes in border security, which most Americans do. But he also is opposing Trump on the national emergency, which half of the voting base also does. So he's not betraying anybody. But you can make an argument, as I said before, yeah, maybe he's betraying Republicans. But if he's betraying Republicans by upholding the Constitution, then what does that say about Republicans, especially ones who campaign on constitutional values? And what's disappointing is, all right, I expect Republican 
politicians to throw out the Constitution. But what I don't expect are Republicans or conservatives who praise the Constitution to then fall in line with the politicians. And this is how, or this is why there is a resentment in two-party politics and the two-party system. You know, when you hear people talking about the two-party duopoly, man, this is part of the reason. Because all these people talk about what their values are, and then they vote for politicians based on their values, right? But they ignore when the politician doesn't believe in their values. They make excuses for the politician voting against their values, or they're lying about what their values are in the first place. Or maybe they're not lying, but they're definitely, maybe they are telling the truth about their values. But then I have to ask the question, what the hell do you know? You obviously don't know what your values are if you give lip service to the Constitution, to these values of limited government, decentralization, and checks and balances, but then you are mad when somebody upholds these values just because it disagrees with an action that you want done now. And then this is where we get into the territory where they start justifying the national emergency that was set on February 15th by Donald Trump. It's not a national emergency. A national emergency would be a huge invasion from Mexico's army. A national emergency would be an asteroid hitting right in the middle of the United States, or on the East Coast or the West Coast, therefore just wiping out the entire coast. A national emergency would be a super tornado that just rips across the entire country, just like one of those cheesy asylum sci-fi movies. By sci-fi, I mean sci-fi channel, not science fiction. Uh, I don't know why I had to make that detail obvious. So that that's just food for thought. <clears throat> but th that's what an national that's what a national emergency would be. I don't think a national emergency is less than a quarter million people sneaking across the border. Should something be done about it? Maybe. Sure. Why not? We can have that conversation all day. Is that a national emergency? No. No, it's not. At least, not to me. And that's kind of the problem with politics, isn't it? Uh, things that should be objective are subjective. Due to the nature of human beings, due to the nature of language, due to the nature of interpretation and meaning, which again is related to human beings. What is an emergency, especially a national emergency? That's something we need to debate, but nonetheless, this isn't it, and I don't think you can justify that it is it. And a lot of them, like, that brings me to another point, to go on a tangent, but a related tangent nonetheless, is this hyperbolic language about being invaded by illegal immigrants. Don't you just love that? <laughs> I do. Listen, y you can dislike illegal immigration. That's fine. Again, you can think we need to do something on the border. But be honest and stand on principle even if you have to endure a little bit of pain. That's what standing on constitutional values or limited government or decentralization of power or checks and balances requires is... A little bit of endurance of pain it's required and that's what Rand Paul is doing here he is standing on these values that everybody on the right gives lip service to but yet doesn't actually believe all right peeps thanks for listening to my podcast um, let me know what you think do you agree with me do you agree with Rand Paul do you agree with Donald Trump what what position do you fall on? Are you an ever-Trumper? 
are you an always Trumper or are you a sometimes Trumper? And I guess here's the main question that I want to ask you. Do you support the Constitution of the United States or do you think we should uphold it even when it disagrees or makes it difficult to implement or enact something that you want enacted? Serious question. Let me know in the comment section below.